When I say Jonah, everybody thinks fish, whale, right? Okay. Can we all just begin with the idea that, hey, a guy getting swallowed by a fish, it's kind of crazy, right? We can we acknowledge that, right? That's pretty nuts, pretty weird. No. Why is it not nuts or weird? Uh, because they're a grouper. They're a big grouper. I was going to say, it's, it's, it is weird, but how about a God who loves you so much? That he paid for your life. How about a God who put his arms around you when you were in death and said, I'm going to pay for your sin. I've already done it. And I'm going to change the trajectory of your life because I love you that much. That's nuts. But it happened. It happened for me. It happened for many of you. That's who God is. The God who literally went... And stars. My favorite passages in all the scriptures in Job when he says, the God who looked at the ocean and said, stop there. That's the God we're talking about. So we're not going to get hung up on this idea of a fish and a guy being in the belly of a fish. Because if he can do stars and he can pay for my sin and he can change my life and your life, I think he can do a fish. Amen. Amen, right? Amen. So this series that we're doing, you see it says Jonah. The idea behind it is, what is your nah to God? What's happening in your life that you're like, you know what, God, nah. Mm -mm. Not giving that up. Not following you in that. Not doing that. Uh -uh. I'm I'm, I'm okay with where I am now. I like where you've placed me. This is comfortable. I don't want to go there. I don't want to do that. Um, Many of you guys know I work in a cell phone store. And the company that I work for, just in the last couple of weeks, came out with new plans. Well, customer comes in this week, and uh, nice, nice older couple, uh, but they were dead set that these new plans were bad for them. They believed it. So I started to interact with them because that's what my job is. I'm supposed to find some common ground, make sure they feel comfortable, you know, actually you know, show them that I care, that I'm not just a clerk trying to get money from them. And then explain to them if this new plan would benefit them. So I did. I walked them through it. And in their case, it actually was a better deal. But they were dead set that it wasn't. And there was nothing I could say or do that would change their mind. They had put up a border. And even though they they, they believed me, they said multiple times, okay, that sounds great, but I'm not going to do it. Even though it actually costs less money for them. In every way, shape, or form, it was better for them. I would have done this for my own mother. They said no. Because they didn't trust me. They didn't really believe that I had their best interest at heart. Believer, you know the feeling. You know who God is. You know he paid for your life, but you don't really trust where he's sending you. You don't really trust his plan. Because it's really hard. And I don't like really hard. I don't want really hard. I want easy. I want the comfortable chair. I want the hugs and kisses, the smiles and kittens. I don't want anything hard. The key principle this morning is that God's plan involves you whether you like it or not. Do you hear me? God is going to use your life, and he's going to use your life whether or not you decide to surrender it. He's the God of the universe. He's using what's happening in your life currently to be an example. Other people are watching. Other people are seeing. If you're a believer, they're looking at your life and he's saying, this, this is what's happening. Other people can see it. They can see what's happening. And he's in control of everything, including what they see. He's going to use your life. He is using your life. Whether you want to be involved or not, whether you want to follow his plan or not, He's that big. He's that powerful. He's God. That's who he is. That's exciting and scary all at the same time. We're not going to shy away from stuff. That's that's scary. Before we jump into Jonah, you should know some of the background. What was happening at the time. Jonah was written between 785 and 775 BCE. 
Okay, that's about the time frame we're talking about in terms of the history of the Jewish people. Now, this is, it's going to sound a bit like a history lesson, but I promise there's a point to this. And if we don't understand the context, it's going to be a lot harder to understand Jonah's heart because that's what God's relaying to us in these four chapters in Jonah, his heart. First thing is that you had a northern kingdom and you had a southern kingdom. Okay, so you had the Jewish people, they decided not to follow God. And part of uh, the, the consequence for that is God literally broke them into two nations. There was a separation. You had the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. We're talking about the northern kingdom here. There was this king named Jeroboam II. Say Jeroboam. Jeroboam. Say the second. second. You guys are so good. Okay, cool. So King Jeroboam II, okay, he comes into power. And God uses Jonah, if you guys make notes, it's uh, 2 Kings chapter 14. God takes Jonah, this prophet who we're going to study, and he uses him to speak into King Jeroboam's life. And part of the thing that he tells him is, hey, there's these borders up north. We're going to reinstate those borders. And you're going to see those here in a moment. So don't hear Jonah and think, this guy was just busted, didn't care anything, and was just doing what he wanted to do. No, no. This guy was a prophet of the Most High God, had spoken for God in a public forum to the king. This guy had a walk with God. He knew who he was. So we can't just beat up on old Jonah. Next thing we want to make sure we understand is Nineveh. Say Nineveh. It was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. Assyria would be the empire to the north of the northern kingdom. Think Syria today. It's the same land, same, same mass. Nineveh, the, the, the city that we're going to be interacting with this morning, that Jonah was dealing with, was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. This was their Washington, D.C. And it was just to the north of Israel. And finally, within 80 years... Israel would fall to them. What we're studying today, within 80 years, God would use Assyria to conquer Israel. And there would be an exile. Here's our border. This is what we're talking about. See the one way up at the top? Say Hamath. That way we all mispronounce it if we mispronounce it. Awesome. Syria is off to the northeast, right? That's how far the border was. That's pretty high up there. Okay? You have the Mediterranean to the left. Mediterranean Sea. Israel is that landmass all on the side here. So God said, Jonah, speak to King Jeroboam II. We're going to extend the border back to where it was supposed to be. So he used Jonah to speak truth into the lives of the people there. They extended the border. So do you think that Jonah is excited about Syria? Do you think he likes them? No, he hates them. That's the neighbor who wants to kill them and has killed them. This is war. These are the people that if you find your, your, if your kids cross that border, your kids could die. This is war here. And Jonah was used by God to help extend the border. So he's walked with God, saw what God was doing, and that's all leading us to where we are. We should probably read the chapter, right? It's kind of important. God's word. Yeah. Amen. Jonah chapter 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city. Call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went on aboard to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. If you make a note, note there that there's not really a place away from the presence of the Lord. Just throwing that out there. Verse 4. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God, and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it up for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give us thought to us and that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots, that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell to Jonah. 
Then they said to him, tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? What people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. He said to them, Pick me up, hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode, the, rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not innocent blood on us, for you, O Lord, have done as you have pleased. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly. And they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Familiar story, right? Jonah's kind of a very sad figure. He's called by God, go speak to your enemy and tell your enemy to repent because they're doing evil. Not, hey, the enemy's up there, and I kind of like them. They're pretty cool people. Go say hi and have a barbecue. No, go into the town square. Tell them that they're sinning. You know these people that would kill you? Go do that. And then Jonah says, "Uh uh-uh, ain't going to happen. And he completely bolts the other way. Why do you care? How does this have anything to do with us? What does the God of the universe plan to speak into your life this morning through this passage? It's principles about God's planning. What can we learn about how God plans, the way God works throughout this passage? The first thing that you see in verses 1 and 2 is that God's plan is clear. There's a clarity principle. God, God's call on our lives is clear. Love Him and be obedient to His word. It's time that we as believers stop trying to muddy this up. Stop acting like I don't know what God's will is for my life. I don't know what his plan is. You may not know where God's sending you. You may not know where you're going to live. But we do know that his word is clear about being obedient to him. About loving him above all and then treating your neighbor as yourself. We know that. How about we stop acting like we don't? God's not behind some curtain going, Ooh, you can't figure it out. Ooh, no, that's not the way God works. God spoke into Jonah's life. He says, get up, go to Nineveh. Does anyone think Jonah didn't get the message? Does anybody think Jonah was like, God, did, 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 did you say, no, Nineveh? No, 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 you said Joppa, right? No, the God of the universe said go to Nineveh. It was very clear. When I see things the way God says they are, it's clear. Do you see it? It's right there. Jonah didn't listen. He decided he would go the, wrong, the other way. This would be like God looking at you and saying, go tell ISIS to repent. Did you hear that? This is the enemy. This is the one who have killed your people. This is the one whom your people have killed. Go tell them to repent. I think we want to beat up on Jonah a little too quick. God was clear, told him what to do, but following God isn't necessarily easy. Sometimes it's very, very hard. I I just recently, within the last couple of weeks, had an opportunity within that store I was telling you about. Uh, I'm, I'm working towards a promotion and getting to, to move up into management. That's something, that's a goal that I've set for myself. And an opportunity presented itself to apply for a promotion at a different store. A store that was closer to home, so less driving, more money in the bank account because not spending so much money on gas, and less time away from the family because right now I'm driving about 35 minutes to work every day. 
35 minutes isn't a big deal. Don't worry. I'm, I'm, I'm not crying about it. But, but where we're from in Highlands County, you know, everything's kind of right there. Well, I'm like, okay, do I do this? Do I not do this? I should probably talk to God because he's kind of God, right? Make sense? So I pray. And I'm like, okay, God, you know, what do I do here? Because th- this, this is where I see things going. But is, is this the opportunity that I go for? The same day that I, made, I prayed, I had two very direct spiritual conversations with guys I've been pouring into at work. These are guys I wouldn't work with if I moved to this other store. And I was like, God, but that's not the answer I wanted. I really wanted to go to the store closer to the house because that's easier. But that's not what he said. What he said was, no, stay where you are. Do what I told you to do because it's about my mission, not your comfort. And I can stand up here and say that I made that decision, but it wasn't easy. And I'm not going to sit up here and be like, oh, yeah, I followed God. No, I, I did. I followed God, but it still hurts. Because I'd really like to drive a lot less time. I'd really like a promotion. But I'd love to follow God. I'd love to trust Him and His plan more. And I'm working on that daily, and hopefully you guys are as well in your own walk with God. It's so crazy how you go through His Word and things pop out that literally are happening in your life right now. How's that apply to you? Think through your life right this moment. The God of the universe is talking to you. The Holy Spirit is doing His work. What is it that's happening in your life that he's been clear on that you may or may not be following him on? What's happening? Where you at? His word is clear. He calls for obedience and he calls for repentance when we're disobedient. How are we doing with that? Next thing that you notice is the paddle principle. You see this in verse 3 through 4. God responds to disobedience by corrective action. Sometimes that action hurts. Do you notice that Jonah, he's like, okay, go to Nineveh. Nope, I'm going to go the opposite direction. Nineveh, you'll see on a map later on, is northeast, right? Remember we saw kind of where Nineveh was? Yeah, Jonah goes southwest. It literally was, hey, go to Maine. And he's like, I'm going to Antarctica. That's what he did. Completely went the opposite direction goes in, pays the fare, because he thinks, hey, you know what, I could just, I could buy, he goes knowing where he wants to go, he wants to go to this city, Tarshish, which you'll see later on, is literally, might as well be on the other side of the world, pays the money to get on the ship, gets on the ship, and it says, God hurled a tempest. The word used here is the same word used when when, uh, Saul, King Saul, threw the spear at David. Threw the spear, hurled it. The God of the universe threw a wind at him. Pause for a second about Jonah's life. Think about that for our own lives. We serve a God who can throw the weather. Throw the weather like a spear. That's insane. Don't tell me he doesn't have control of fish. That's the God we serve. Why didn't he just kill Jonah? Jonah completely disrespected him. Jonah said no. Jonah had had a walk with God. And God clearly told him what to do. And didn't strike him dead. Because the point of the corrective action is to be corrective. God wants us to follow him. He wants us to walk with him. He doesn't want to destroy us. Here's the, here's the lie, though. Here's the lie the enemy hits you with, and you've all felt it. You sin, God just wants to destroy me. I'm terrible. I'm worthless. I'm caught up in my own sin. I suck. I can't do anything right. I just want to die. That's where Jonah's at. We'll see it later on in the passage. When I screwed up as a kid, my parents disciplined me. They did that because they were correcting my behavior. Maybe they should have done it more and I wouldn't be the way I am today. I'm just totally kidding. You can laugh at that. Man, no laughing. All right, fine. Have you been disciplined by God recently? When's the last time you were disciplined by God? How'd that feel? It's not great. But part of knowing God's plan is understanding when you're being disciplined and seeing it for what it is. He's correcting your path. You gave him your nah. You said, I'm not doing it. And he said, no, you are. 
And I'm not going to just kill you. I'm not going to destroy you. Although, remember, I have the ability to do that. I can throw weather. No, I'm going to give you corrective action. I'm going to bring you back into the path that I've called you to. God's desire is repentance, not destruction. Next you see in verses 5 and 6 a community principle. Disobedience is sin. Choosing sin means others may have consequences for your choices. Don't believe the lie for a second that your sin is only about you. When you sin, consequences come and other people have to live with those consequences. Talk to the wife whose husband has the porn addiction. Is it her sin? Why he can't stop looking at the internet? But it's affecting her. It's affecting the kids in the home. Talk to the husband whose wife doesn't deal with her emotions and has a resentful heart and anger and hurt inside. Is it his sin? It's affecting him. It's affecting the kids. It's affecting the home they're raised in. It will affect the grandkids later. Your sin does not just affect you. You come with your bad attitude into work, it affects everyone. Your sin is not just about you. The consequences are, are all over the place. Did these guys wrong God on this boat? No, these are just some working dudes on their way to Tarshish. That's a really long trip. They're getting in the boat, they're like, all right, going on another trip. And then all of a sudden, the worst storm they've ever seen has been thrown at them. They had nothing to do with Nineveh. They had nothing to do with, with uh, Jonah. They had nothing to do with Israel. These are shit guys. These are, these are guys that are just sailing. They're trying to get their job done. These, this is the FedEx driver who gets plastered by a semi-truck who's been drinking. They did nothing wrong. And of course, they're freaking out, wouldn't you? Right? You're going to die. It's not like, you know, today, I mean, we still have accidents with boats today, but the technology is nowhere near. You're going to see a storm like that. It's looking like it's going to go down. Is there sin that you're not dealing with in your own life? Think through that. Camp here for a minute. Where are you at? Is there sin that you're harboring? Because if there is, that you're not taking it to God, it's affecting you and those that you love and those you interact with. The job you have, and it could be affecting your kids and their kids. It, it's all connected. I love this one. Verses 7 through 9. The bigger than sin principle. Just because sin is chosen doesn't mean the follower of Christ is benched. He chooses when and where to use you. That's a picture of the sun, obviously. Do you see the earth? Not really, right? <laughs> okay, it's, it's basically the size of an ant on the screen. And that's the sun. And he went, whoop, there you go. And then he did that for like a billion other galaxies. Like billions, like with a B, and more than that, I think. That's the God we serve. And the sin that we allow in our lives that we don't deal with is not bigger than the God who did that. Jonah is sleeping. They had this crazy storm, and Jonah is sleeping. They call him up, and they're like, come on, talk to your God, because they've already talked to theirs. And guess what? <laughs> Nobody answered. Nobody picked up when they were knocking at the door. All right, you talk to your God. Who are you? They cast lots. It's like rolling dice to figure out, okay, who did this? Because this is not just a regular storm. This is obviously a, a God moment. And, of course, the fell to Jonah. Didn't see that coming, right? So then it falls to Jonah, and then they're looking at him, and they're like, who are you? And then Jonah says, I'm a Hebrew. I fear the God of, uh, the, the, how's he word it? I fear the God who controls the land and the, and the sea. Does that sound a little hollow right about now? Right? If I'm Jonah, I fear him. 
I totally fear this God. But not enough that I wouldn't go the complete opposite direction when he clearly told me what to do. Because I think that my sin has disqualified me from everything. The sin that I'm not dealing with is just the most important thing in the world. I'm so hung up. Remember the lie? That's where Jonah's living right now. And God uses him. God uses him to tell them who the real God is. Because you'll find out who the real God is when you're about to die on, on the sea, right? When it's about to go down? Yeah. That's the come to Jesus moment. Yeah? Crazy. Some of the most profitable times I've had in ministry were when my heart was far from God. I, I come out of a youth ministry background. And there have been times in my life when I wanted nothing to do with what God was calling me to do. I wanted nothing to do with the work that it took. I wanted nothing to do with the people I was doing it with. I was just about me. And I wanted to do my own thing. And I wanted to just say enough. And in a lot of the time, in those moments, it was some of the most profitable ministry that God's ever used me for. I was done. I don't want anything to do with this. I don't want to hear about your problems. I got my own. And then that 15-year-old who has a problem with the way his parents are interacting with him. That kid who has no idea what to do comes to you. And this kid is telling me his story, and I'm talking to God going, Really? I want nothing to do with this right now, God. I'm dealing with my own stuff. And he puts the immature believer in my path. He puts the unbeliever in my path. It's happened to many of you, I know. That's hard. You don't want it, but he does it. Because you don't get to say when you're benched. You don't get to say, God, I'm done now. God's plan involves you whether you want to or not. He's using you. He has you placed where you are for a reason. And we're not going to get into a theological discussion about whether or not these guys on this boat were saved or not saved. What we do know is they saw God's power. And they heard about who God was. I don't know what the rest of their life looked like, but I know what that night looked like. I know that God used Jonah. And I know that Jonah did not want to be used by God. Finally, the Na principle. Verses 10 through 17. God uses everything for his glory. This also includes our disobedience. Jonah, when offered the opportunity, when they said, why did you sin against your God? How do we stop this? Did he say, turn the boat around, I'll get on my knees and pray? He said, throw me in the water. That's where his heart was, guys. My heart breaks for Jonah right now. He chose death over following God. In that moment, he decided, I would rather die than go to Nineveh. Before I was okay getting in the boat and just going to the other side of the world. See where Tarshish is? Now I choose death. I will not go to Nineveh. I will not do it. I will not follow you, God. I will not do it. That's what he said to the God of the universe. They threw him in the water. Continue reading in chapter 2, which we'll cover next week. The fish didn't immediately grab him. The weeds got to his legs. He fell. It was over. Jonah chose to die rather than following God. Imagine where his heart was for that to be his decision. So hardened, so embittered, so hurt. I do not trust your plan, God. Nah, I ain't going to do it. And you know what God said? He said no to Jonah's nah. He said, no, 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 Jonah. You, you, you got this messed up. You, you're, you're missing the point here. You don't get to pick when I use you. You are not in control. I am. I am God. I will look at Nineveh and I will choose whether or not someone will go. And guess what? It's going to be you. And I will offer corrective action after corrective action after corrective action to get you to where I'm called you to be. 
And if that requires you falling into the water and thinking you're going to die and then a fish to swallow you, I'm willing to do that because I'm God. Have you ever been in a place where you can't think it'll get any worse and it keeps getting worse? It just doesn't stop. And you're ready to choose death rather than take one more step. That's where Jonah was. And God said, no, 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 no. I will use your life whether you want me to or not. I love you that much. Don't miss that. That's the crazy part that's awesome about this. It's not just God sitting up going, I'm the greatest thing ever. It's, I love you so much, I won't allow you to destruct yourself. Now, this is tricky because you could very easily twist this into some crazy theological debate. What I'm saying is that the God of the universe showed us he had a plan for Jonah's life, and he said, I will do it through your life, and I love you enough to save you. I know that he did that for me because I chose not to follow him. I heard the Bible. I went to church. I enjoyed it. I love debating people about who Jesus was. I said, no, I'm not doing it because I think it's stupid. And he said, no, I'm saving you anyway. And he did. What fish are you in? Where are you at? What's going on? Are, is that where you're at? Have you said no and God says no to your no? You don't get to pick. I'm the God of the universe. I'm powerful enough, I'm strong enough, and I love you enough to not let you make this choice. Follow me. I've called you. I've been clear about my word. I've told you what it will cost you to follow me. Follow me. What corrective, what corrective action is it going to take? I asked you a question in the beginning. Why do you care? Why do you care? Because God's clear in his direction in your life. Did you hear that? He's clear. He absolutely is clear. Don't allow the enemy to make you think anything otherwise. He will correct you when you're off track. Your sin affects more than just you. God's plan is bigger than your sin. And finally, God will use you whether you like it or not. Because he's God. And he can do that. And he loves you. In closing, I want to read to you the beginning of chapter 4. Picture Jonah's heart as these words come out. The end of chapter 3, Nineveh repents. We're totally giving you guys the rest of the story. God go, or no, Jonah goes to Nineveh. Nineveh repents. After Nineveh repents, this is Jonah's response. Chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, Oh Lord, is this not what I said was going to happen when I was in my country? That's why I made haste and fled to Tarshish. For I knew that you are gracious God. I knew that you're merciful. I knew that you're slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And you're relenting from disaster. I knew that. Therefore now, oh Lord, please take my life. For it's better for me to die than to live. Jonah, even after all of that, his heart was far from God. He said, I knew what you were doing. I didn't want to be a part of it. And then I knew, I know your character, God. I've spoken with you. I walk with you. I know what you're going to do because I know how you are. And I didn't want to be a part of you saving those Ninevites. I didn't want to do it. And then you made me do it. And I came in and look what you did. I would rather be dead right now than have walked with you in this. That's where Jonah's heart was. That's, that's how ter the, my heart breaks for this guy. That's where he was living in this. Jonah knew who God was, but he didn't trust his plan. He didn't trust that the God of the universe was big enough, strong enough, powerful enough to know what he was doing. And said, I don't want to be a part of that. It's wrong. In closing, here's the part Jonah missed. Do not miss this. This is really important. Jonah goes to Nineveh. They repent. God told them there was going to be destruction in Nineveh if they did not repent. And they did repent. After Nineveh repents, 
there's a few years where God then begins speaking through a prophet named Hosea to the people of, of the northern kingdom. And God starts using Nineveh as the people that are going to destroy Israel if Israel doesn't begin following God. It's a lot of words. Hear this. God used Nineveh. He repent, He restored them. And he said, now to my people Israel, look at what's happening in Nineveh. They're getting stronger. They're getting more powerful. Follow me or destruction is coming your way. And they didn't. Nineveh then comes in and destroys the northern kingdom. They stopped following God. They came over and destroyed the northern kingdom. Then God talked to his people while they're in Nineveh, in the exile, in, in Assyria, and he restored them. There's a lot of levels working here. I know it's hard to follow, but hear this. God was working when he was talking to Jonah about going to Nineveh. God was working out how he would restore his people 80 years later. Do you hear who the God of the universe is? Do you see what he was doing? He's working on so many levels that we can't even fathom. We can trust his plan. We can look at Nineveh and say, God, why would you restore them? Oh, you're restoring them so that you can restore us later because we are going to say no to you. That's who God is. That's the high level stuff God is doing. That's only within an 80 year span. Guys, he's been at this for a couple thousand years with just us. What's he doing? We can trust his plan. We know who he is. We can trust where he's calling us. God's plan is for him to declare to the universe who he is. He's equipped us to be a part of it. And you're going to be a part of it whether you want to or not. So let's be excited about being part of it.